sense of where the project fits in my scholarship, uh, give a brief overview of um, the uh, argument and explain a little more about the family from whose letters I'm drawing on here. Although some of you who've read my work will be familiar with these people too. I feel that I am related to them already. Um, and, um, and, and characteristically, I actually have a presentation and pictures. And um, I'm going to highlight some of the ideas and the questions, which are, for me anyway, the most interesting. So, um, Deciding to do this presentation could be described either as overenthusiastic or foolhardy. Um, as you'll have read, have read, it's based on all of two weeks of um, archival work and what reading I've managed to do for a project which is very much in its early phases. My work, generally speaking thus far, has focused on histories of childhood and youth in Africa. Um, I have a forthcoming introduction to the scholarship of Palgrave and histories of childhood in South Africa as they intersect with um, histories of race, gender and sexuality. So that's kind of where my work, um, the, where this project fits into um, my uh, work. A couple of years ago, the American Historical Review published a roundtable discussion um, on the field of the history of childhood and youth in which um, Sarah Maza suggested that there's a crisis within the field because she argues its preoccupations and debates have yet to cross over um, the disciplinary mainstream. Um, no history department has yet advertised a position on the history of childhood, for instance. This provocation has generated, as you can imagine, a range of responses. And mine is that good histories of childhood ask us to think more broadly about age as a category of historical analysis. And to be sure, I'm certainly not the only person who makes this point. Um, histories of childhood are histories of adulthood too. So I think for me, this project of menopause um, represents sort of a, a, a broadening out of thinking about um, histories of age categories. So it's this observation which informs my next project, which shifts focus to menopause. As I note in the paper, there's a really great scholarship on the history of the medicalization of menopause, particularly focused on the United States. And I think that this is for good reason. Um, these books, studies um, speak to the present and they're animated by how clinical debates over menopause shape perimenopausal women's experiences. And perhaps the best example of this being a 2002 report, which um, was misleadingly interpreted to suggest that perimenopausal women on hormone replacement therapy faced higher than normal risk for breast cancer. A lot of historical research was animated by this, this scandal. My interest, though, um, is in women's own interpretation of perimenopause and menopause, and during or slightly before the condition was medicalized and studied by medical professionals, and I'll return to this question of medicalization in a moment. It's for this reason um, that, I that I begin the paper with what is the biggest um, challenge for this project, <laughs> um, finding an archive of women's reflections on perimenopause and menopause. Um, to be clear, perimenopause um, describes the slow process by which the body no longer produces adequate quantities of estrogen to allow for menstruation and thus pregnancy. Menopause is diagnosed a certain number of months after a woman's final menstrual cycle. Perimenopause is signified by a range of symptoms and tends to manifest from women's um, 40s. But of course, this differs enormously across the population. So now I'm going to share my screen. Um, all right. Um, okay, sorry, I, my computer is quickly just asking me to, um, if, if it wants um, to allow me to make this, um, to share the screen, sorry about this, sort of admin in the middle of a presentation, not a great idea. Um, what happens so, when I make you co-host, you become a, a co-host. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, um, so I'm going to just um, share screen now. Um, there we go. Voila. There. The admin worked. Apologies about that, folks. Um, so slideshow, play from current slide. There you go. So then, um, I, um, I use uh, the correspondence of the Murray family as an initial archive to answer these questions. Um, as I make the point in the paper, the letters written by the Murray women were informed by the particular familial dynamics of the Murrays, the Hofmeyers, and the Neatlings, three families that are very closely intermarried into one another. 
But they share similar religious, social, and to some degree political views with other contemporary Christians, recent converts or not, in the region. And this isn't to suggest that this correspondence is in any way representative and not shaped by these families' high status in the colony as white, upper middle class, and well educated. Rather, um, that they might be broad themes which cut across these letters and, for instance, those written by, for instance, the Sorgo family in the Eastern Cape or indeed other mission or church linked families in Southern Africa or beyond. So just to say something about the Murrays. Andrew Murray Sr., who is on your screen, um, was born in Aberdeen to a very large, very pious Church of Scotland family. They were later part of a schism that formed the Free Church of Scotland, an evangelical schism. Um, in, he was born in 1794 and was one of 11 Scottish ministers who travelled to the Cape on the invitation of the colonial government to take up positions of leadership in the Dutch Reformed Church in 1821. In Cape Town, he met Maria Stegman, um, the woman on the left, who was then 16 years old, and she was part of the um, uh, family that dominated the Lutheran Church in the Cape. Um, and they married um, and eventually settled in Hrafrenet. Um, uh, where An Andrew Senior was appointed moderator of the Dutch Reformed Church, and they had 12 children who, um, they had 12 children who survived into adulthood. Most of their sons, and I'm just going to quickly skip ahead to the next slide, and I do promise these are all totally different people, they may look very similar, um, and most, most of their sons and several of their sons-in-law became not only Dutch Reformed Church ministers, but senior and important figures in the church. For instance, Andrew, Andrew Jr. followed his father as moderator. His brother John was a founding professor of the Dutch Reformed Church's seminary in Stellenbosch. And um, their brother William founded the Schools for the Deaf and the Blind in Worcester, for instance. All of their daughters either married ministers or became involved in institutions, most, mostly schools associated with the Dutch Reformed Church. So I divide the paper into two, and I'll just skip back so you can take a look at Maria Murray surrounded with most of her children. I divide the paper um, into two, beginning to think through conceptual and then imperial histories of menopause. I begin the second section of the paper with two letters, which I describe in the paper. Um, there we go. Um, it's, and these two letters it consist of a child's note to his grandmother enfolded in his mother's letter. The letter was written by Kitty Murray in September 1872, a year after her marriage to George Murray, and two years after George became the Dutch Reformed Church Minister for Willamore in the Eastern Cape. As I write in the paper, the note by Georgie was probably he, um, their fourth child, born in 1876. This note was then probably written in the late 1870s, and the fact that it is enfolded in a too early letter is probably because of the kinds of mix-ups which happened in busy clerical households. But this temporal mix-up invites us to think about these letters in time, and specifically in terms of the biological histories of their author and reader. Um, I'll quickly move ahead to the, a photograph of um, the George Murray family, as they were known. Um, and um, just also, and how quickly before I go look at that photograph, I just want to show you a list of all of their children. Um, one um, member of the family compiled a kind of family history which has these very elaborate family trees. So this just gives you a sense of just how many children they had. Um, and this was by no means the biggest uh, family within the Murray family. Um, and uh, Kitty was... Um, 20 at the birth of her first child, and between then and the birth of her 16th baby, she gave birth to her child every 12 to 24 months. The largest space between the births is between her second last and last children, Catherine, born in 1895, who's the youngest baby in this photograph, and Louise in 1900, who's yet to be born here. George, her husband, was chaplain to were prisoners of war in Ceylon during the South African War and was thus absent for a few years. But paying attention to Kitty's age helps to explain why she had her last child in 1900. She was 48 years old. She was likely to have been perimenopausal during the five years between her two youngest children. Her almost constant pregnancy between 1872 and 1900 was by no means unusual either within her broader circle in the Cape Colony or elsewhere. Most of Kitty's sisters and sisters-in-law fell pregnant shortly after marriage and continued having babies until their, mid, um, their early mid to late 40s with birth spaces of anything between one to three years. As this account of Kitty's reproductive life, this hormonal history might imply, my interest here is of course in the conclusion of women's childbearing. So why my interest in menopause? 
Firstly, um, as a biological process, which most cisgendered women go through, should they live long enough, menopause becomes a way of accessing the past through a single shared experience. Secondly, unlike puberty, historical scholarship on menopause remains relatively small. Well, since the early 2010s, there's been a growing popular discourse on menopause, um, on menopause, but historians, I feel, have been slow to follow suit, except as regards, as I said earlier, an excellent and growing interest in the medicalization of menopause. I'm interested, of course, in women's own understanding or interpretation of perimenopause and menopause. And thirdly, menopause helps um, to link the scholarship on gender to research on age, race and empire, illuminating how age is a vector of power intersected with race and gender categories in the making of the colonial social order. This I hope to prove. So in the paper, I describe the medicalization of menopause in the early 19th century, thanks largely to the work of two scholars, Charles-Paul Louis de Gardin and E.J. Tult. I want um, only to emphasize here that their conceptualization of menopause didn't necessarily represent a rejection of early, earlier modes of thinking, rather an overlapping of a collection of ideas. In addition, Gardan, Tilt and others were motivated by contradictory impulses. While the term menopause was, quote, intended to reassure women that the cessation of men's disease was nothing per se to be concerned about, as Alison Moore writes, they still included dire warnings of the negative symptoms that might occur in women's aging um, uh, if they did not submit to an appropriate set of hygienic me measures. As Alison Moore um, uh, sums up, um, from the beginning, menopause was both a depathologizing concept and a prescriptive hygienic one. In providing that very brief conceptual history of menopause and an account of menopause as a biocultural phenomenon, I want to avoid the usual binary pitfalls of research into the intersections of medicine, gender, and culture. Medicalization bad, um, non-medicalized experience good, medicalization as a rejection of all belief that went before, and an epistemic rupture in the understanding of the process, while a folk account of menopause endured unchanging across vast periods of time. I want to avoid these precisely because my interest is in how women explain menopause to themselves and to one another in a time shortly before or during the emergence of a post-enlightenment and modern scientific discourse on menopause. Um, the second part of the paper, um, and, and I just, I like this pithy quote about, about menopause. There's no universal menopausal entity or experience waiting to be exposed through systematic inquiry, although the end of menstruation is of course universal. I just thought that that sums up very nicely what we mean by a bicultural phenomenon by a group of sociologists and anthropologists. Um, I want to um, move on then to the second half of the paper, which provides a kind of imperial history of menopause. Um, and I use um, the example of colonial anxiety over pubescent girls to make my argument there. While African or indigenous girls' sexuality was believed to pose a threat to the stability of the colonial state, white middle-class girls' sexuality, uh, which in settler colonies especially was tied to the maintenance of white control over colonial politics, the economy and society, was to be protected, and especially through raising the age of consent, which it was believed would protect them from predatory black and working class men. It's worth understanding that these concerns occurred in changing biological and cultural contexts. In industrializing societies around the world, the age of puberty for girls had gradually lowered since the 19th century as better diets and medical care contributed to girls attaining the requisite weight for menstruation to begin far earlier. This lowering of the age of the onset of menstruation occurred initially for middle-class girls who were also the first to experience modernity's experience, uh, extended childhoods. These girls not only stayed at home and in school for much longer than earlier generations of women, um, but perhaps even more importantly, were regarded as girls by adults, not as young ladies. So for example, by the end of the 19th century, overwhelmingly, but not exclusively, white middle-class 15-year-olds were considered to be girls by their parents and wore the clothing and inhabited the spaces of children, despite probably having commenced menstruating, while working-class poor and indigenous young women of the same age were often considered by adults in positions of authority um, to be women in employment, most importantly, while not necessarily having begun to menstruate. In the eyes of their parents, they might or might not um, have been children, depending on context. Multiple ways of categorizing age existed side by side, even if some attained hegemonic status over time. If pubescent girls were understood as representing various forms of crisis as the nature of puberty and of girlhood changed, how then was menopause perceived? As nation states from the 19th century positioned women essentially as mothers is crucial for the reproduction of the nation itself. So the link between womanhood and sexual reproduction was deeply entrenched. 
In colonies where women's presence was frequently justified on the grounds of their capacity to reproduce, what then was the role of the menopausal women? And how was this gendered category racialized? And so here, I'll turn to the extract from the letter by Maria Nietlen, with which I begin and conclude my paper. As I write, these women's correspondence frequently concerns markers of aging, of moving from one age category, a biological and a social construct to the next, be it short coating, wearing long dresses or getting married. First pregnancies and babies were, of course, another marker of full ascension to motherhood and also to grandmotherhood. Given these examples, did women reflect on the cessation of childbearing? This is why I find the paragraph in Maria Nietzsche's letter so interesting. With this earlier than expected pregnancy, is she signaling an awareness of perimenopause? This question, the question of course, is the degree to which this group of women understood how conception functioned. And I use an example from a letter from her younger sister Eliza to explore this question, perhaps inconclusively. Now I'll begin to wrap up. Is it possible to extrapolate then Maria Nietzsche's own awareness in a change in her reproductive system? For a woman who had been so frequently pregnant and who was to remain surrounded by young children for at least another decade or so, did the cessation of childbearing represent relief or other feelings? How did she explain this change to herself in both biological and emotional terms, especially given that she existed within a cosmopolitan colonial milieu that read eagerly books and periodicals from abroad? I know that this is tenuous um, evidence, but what it opens up is the possibility for reading for a hormonal history one which tracks women's uh, perceptions of their fertility and their explanation for what changes occurred in their hormonal cycles. And, and uh, even if they had no idea as to the existence of hormones, and that is actually part of the point. I'd like to pause here and ask for your thoughts and questions. Um, areas I know I need to think more about are how Christianity, and specifically evangelical Christianity in this case, shaped women's thinking about the cessation of childbearing and the relationship between race and menopause and the relationship between class and menopause. Because of the kinds of sources I'll be working with, I framed this project from the beginning as one which does focus on middle-class women, but I would like to think about this more. So that's a very quick rundown. <laughs> um, I'll stop uh, sharing my screen and um, fling your words at me. Thank you, Sarah. That was very, very good. Very, And um, thank you for being so succinct. Um, so, uh, I obviously, I'm opening up for questions and a reminder, uh, perhaps especially to some of our postgraduates, that um, you can raise your hand using the raise hand function, which is under reactions, which is a horrible but button. Um, and you can also message me privately if you really can't otherwise get my attention. And uh, yeah, so I think I see a hand from Nafisa and obviously looking for other hands. Nafisa? Hello. Hi, Sarah. I'm sorry Hello. I can't turn my video on. I'm, um, yeah, in sort of at the tail end of a bout of gastric flu and I look awful. Um, it, but I'm really happy to have read your paper and, uh, well, I've enjoyed it very much. And um, this is a very exciting project. And I have questions based mostly in, you know, extreme ignorance. Um, and, you know, I just, maybe there's nothing to say about them, but I'm just going to ask them anyway. Um, so uh, I suppose my first question is, um, is in a similar way to say to Menak or the onset of menses, does the, it seems to me that, that, that there's an acknowledgement of the changing sort of uh, age categories of Menak, but how does men, is that reflected in menopause at all? So does menopause, uh, the age of menopause change, um, you know, based on whatever factors affect these things, you know, nutrition and um, other, health indicators and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm, you know, I was very interested in the, the pictures you showed us are wonderful. And the amazing thing about that is those women are 80 years old. Um, and I mean, I, I you know, I, as you know, um, those of us uh, uh, um, sort of academically raised in other parts of the country have trouble coping with the Cape. Um, so, you know, what little I know from, I think, you know, an 80s article by Simpkins and Van Hanegan and a, a little bit of other stuff is that life expectancy in the Cape by the end of the 19th century, and so this is a cross class and race, um, is somewhere between 35 and 45. Um, and so these 
I'm wondering about the generalizability of menopause as opposed to say the generalizability of mena. Um, I mean, you, I love that you frame it as an age question because that allows both ends of uh, the question to come into play. Um, also given, I mean, it's interesting also because life expectancy is also tied to, you know, the onset and end of fertility in women. So these questions all sort of, you know, fold back on each other. So, yeah, I suppose it's, it's to say that, you know, it's only in the, like the, in the last end of uh, the study where, you know, a, a big enough proportion of women start living past 40. Um, so I'm just wondering if people had menopause a lot earlier or, um, yeah, I'm just, you know, wondering where the traces of those are. Also, um, sorry, I won't go on too long. I just wanted to wonder how, I feel like menopause is a lot harder to track in people who don't write letters than say menarch because menarchs are full of ritual and cultural, um, you know, markers. There are all these ways that people mark an entrance into adulthood for young girls, but not uh, so much for, for menopause. I mean, and, and, you know, th th this is exactly the thing we hope not to do, right? You someone presents a paper and they're like, oh, why aren't you studying something else? Um, no, um, <laughs> study age, it's fabulous. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just, yeah, I was just thinking about those things and uh, yeah, I, I, we can of course talk plenty more about this, but I'm, I'm really interested in all of these questions and thank you for animating them, Sarah. You can go, we'll go one, on, one, for, one for one for now, Sarah. Um, cool, thank you. So, Navisa, thank you so much. And I'm sorry you're feeling sick. Thank you for, for being here, nonetheless. I am grateful. Um, these are fantastic questions. And I had not thought, uh, this is quite embarrassing, I hadn't thought at all about questions of life expectancy. You're totally right. Um, this is absolutely true. And, and um, this is, um, so for, to answer, to go to be systematic, um, as far as I know, the age of menopause, the onset of menopause does not change. I will go and invest, I need to investigate this further, but to, as far as I can see, it doesn't, that it, if for some, that it seems to set in, in women's forties during this period. Um, so that in itself is interesting. And I need to, I think I need to find answers for this. Out, um, yeah, that, that, see, that, that does not seem to change, but I need to investigate this further. So this, I think, suppose is why I think that I, you know, sort of thinking about a class politics of menopause becomes um, important because one of the, the key texts for inspiring this um, project um, is an, um, an, a, a book by uh, which I referenced in the paper by Adam Cooper about um, siblinghood in 19th century families in which he makes the point that middle class families become so big and have such, they have the extended life, um, long, much longer um, uh, life expectancy than the rest of the population. And so this is why I'm beginning to think that the, there's a class politics to writing about menopause in the 19th century, that only sort of um, certain people who occupy certain class positions, people who are wealthy enough, people who can afford medical care, um, are able to experience menopause. Um, so this, and you're right about Menarch, that it is definitely much easier to, to pick up because precisely of all the rituals and the markers. But I'm just, so I'm wondering then, is there something that women do to mark the end of, the, you know, of childbearing? You know, when you've been pregnant for such a long time, is there something that these women might do or think um, after the, the birth of their last child. And I want to see if I can find that. Um, I'm sorry, these are not very coherent answers, but I, you can tell that I'm beginning to think this through. Thank you. Excellent, it's a conversation. Uh, so I have Brett next. Oh, hi, uh, thanks for a really interesting paper. And uh, I think that everything you're saying sounds great. Um, I work uh, uh, part of the year, I work in Australia and I work with Alison Moore. So I, I've known her for, for many years and, and she, she, because UJ and Western Sydney have a, you know, a historical relationship, uh, she's certainly someone uh, that could be brought into conversations if you wanted to do future workshops and stuff. And she's really open to traveling and is just a really great, awesome person. So if you haven't met her already, maybe you have, I highly recommend that you just drop her a note and say that sort of, we just, we just, we met electronically, but um, 
I just had a question really about um, birth rates and uh, the 19th century. And I'm, I'm, this is not my area of history, but I do know that in, within, you know, the, there was an explosion in the population in the, in, in the Anglo world for high birth rates. And I'm just wondering if this sort of uh, either plays into or maybe helps you to identify more archives, but it also seems that maybe there's a kind of a unique moment of, of settler colonial expansion where there is, are these high birth, there's this high birth rate. Um, and I just, I'm wondering that will provide more evidence, but it would be interesting to think about if you move into the 20th century then, and uh, people do marry later, right? And sexual attractive, but sexual attractiveness also plays a much bigger role in how people pick marriage partners from the 1920s and on. That's kind of, well, this was, anyway, this was in the literature. I was reading a book uh, on food then uh, it was talking about this this changing how health food became popular in the 1920s and 30s because attractiveness in, in people and sport became more important. But it, anyway, it's just I was just was wondering if if there was a kind of a you know a, a influence of the birth rate on this as a social process and and whether the 19th century in the in the last part of it would you know in some ways would be would be would it be a unique period or or what are the continuities? So what's the continuity? What's the change? And yeah, it's just, it's just really interesting project. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, I think it's great. And I, I really look forward to hearing your answer and, and the other questions. Thank you, Brett. And thank you also for your offer. That, that's extraordinary. What a, an absolute coincidence. Thank you. I might be in touch with you about getting in touch with Alison Wirsch. Her work has, has been really, really important. Thank you. Um, that is such a great question about birth rates in the 19th century. And I need to look this up for the Cape Colony. Um, the one, the one thing that I can certainly say is that across the world in industrializing states in the 19th century, we see an expansion of middle class families, certainly, that those families become much bigger simply because more children are, um, are surviving into adulthood and uh, women are surviving um, childbirth. So middle class families are certainly getting a lot bigger. Um, I mean, as we know in the early 19th century, in those precisely in those industrializing societies, populations um, come under a great deal of strain because of um, urbanization and so on. Um, but by the end of the 19th century, we know that certainly middle class families are a lot bigger. And, and I, I, I'm beginning to think that this is actually a project in some ways um, about the changing nature of the middle class family in the late 19th century. But still, thank you. I need to go and answer these questions. I need to go and answer. What is the birth rate for the Cape Colony during this period? I must remember this, and what I must think more carefully about life expectancy. Thank you. I have Simone, Natasha, and Julie. Simone, um, like everybody, I love this paper. I, I, it was so easy and wonderful to read, um, and I like your empirical work. It doesn't seem like two weeks. I mean, it's great. I wanted to put. I wanted to ask you to expand on your thinking a little bit about empire and the the relationship between empire and and menopause. So I hear you talking about um, what is the position of child of women who have have not given given or, or women who no longer give birth, um, but they still have children, right? They still are childbearing. So. Whereas there are, there must have been some women who were not childbearing at all, and they have an impact. So my question really is to ask you to talk a little bit more about how you see this playing out in terms of power structures and dynamics within empire itself on a more theoretical level rather than the empirical. Um, thank you. Thank you. Devastatingly hard question there. Thank you very, very much. That's an excellent, brilliant question. Thank you. And um, I must admit that um, one of the reasons why this paper was such a joy to write is that I know this archive incredibly well. As I've said to Stephen earlier, I feel like I'm, I sort of, I'm related to these people by now. I know them very, very well. So that is an, so this goes to the heart of my paper, this question of what, what is the position of the woman who can no longer have children within the colony? And I think you can tell particularly that, you know, my question here, my thinking here is shaped particularly around um, the, the settler colony. What do we do with the women who can't reproduce anymore? So in my paper, I've got a line in that I say I want to be attentive to women who don't have children either, that this project could it also then asks us to think about uh, what is the position of the woman who doesn't have children. I'm if, to refer to the Murray family, for instance, there's one um, daughter, Helen, who doesn't get married, who doesn't have children. 
but she is co she's considered to be important because she found she found schools. She still spends all of her time around children, particularly around um, young girls. So she mothers in a different way. So one way in which my thinking is going is that this um, what this project is doing is that it's helping to think about how ideas about motherhood change in the late 19th century and empire that once a woman can no longer give birth um, biologically, she can still mother in, in other ways that she can, um, she's still looking after children, she can still become involved in looking after schools and missionary work and so on, that motherhood itself sort of expands. Um, so I suppose that that's kind of where my thinking is tending at the moment, that this is asking us to think more broadly about how motherhood would be defined, because as far as I can see, that's how women's presence in these places is going to be justified as their presence of mother, as being mothers. Um, and that's how they tend to um, justify their own, as we know, the very big scholarship on, on motherhood in the public sphere. And that, that that's where they tend to justify their position within the colony. Um, I suppose that my question more specifically is, are women thinking about menopause and this, this shift in this sort of opening up of what we might mean by motherhood? But that's only a partial answer. So that's where my thinking is tending. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. There are some more questions building up, including in the chat, but we'll get there. Natasha. Um, hi, Sarah, it's great to see you. And uh, let me just shift my camera so it's not picking up all all the light, there we go. Um, uh, I had a couple of questions for you and just suggestions for further research. Um, one of which has to do with uh, how you are planning to engage with the um, rather large uh, uh, amount of more recent, certainly since the early 2000s work on menopause in terms of, of, of kind of, um, uh, biomedical concerns and I think that you're quite correct in what you say so far that that um, you know the histories of medicine the empirical histories of, of medicine should not be overlooked in this because they do very much have a bearing uh, on what you're talking about and I'm thinking particularly about the way in which understandings of menopause have proliferated since the early 2000s, especially in terms of the effects of hormones um, uh, and understandings of how um, things like HRT are figured so heavily in contemporary understandings of menopause. So that's one thing. And I think it is probably something you might find quite useful. The other thing uh, that occurs to me is that um, the one thing that we know about African society uh, is that uh, there are a whole range of taboos around menstruating women. So the moment, I mean, and basically the moment you stop menstruating, you can walk across the cattle corral. And this is quite well documented in a, in a, in a sense in some of the historical work, um, particularly around women regions in the Eastern Cape and in KwaZulu-Natal and the way in which women can hold power after they've ceased to be fertile. Um, so, I mean, that's just an interesting riff on what you're looking at. And then I wanted to ask you also about what about um, 19th century medical diagnoses of menopause, which would of course have been made by men because there are uh, medical complications that can arise as a result of menopause. And I'm wondering what and how uh, doctors were approaching this. If, if, if in the 19th century, um, there was a, you know, like there was, around the science of, you know, the hysterical woman, whether there was a science of the menopause woman and whether in fact they were linked. And then I just wanted to mention something. Um, you and Brett have been talking about demographic transitions and birth rates. And I think if you look at the data, you'll find that the demographic transition in Western Europe, I mean, it's a really interesting point, is tracked just before the advent of the industrial rev revolution. And so I think you need to be quite careful about passing out um, I was using the term P-A-R-S-I-N-G, not, not the other one, um, comments uh, about birth rates, because um, to what extent are the colonies different from what's happening in the UK? To what extent is class affecting birth rates? So the demographic transition occurs in Europe 
prior to the Industrial Revolution and prior to the advent of any form of kind of widely available contraception, uh, as we would understand it. Um, but these are, this is aggregated data for the whole of uh, Western Europe. And one of the big things that the demographic transition theorists look at in terms of Africa is to chart when indeed there's a demographic transition. Um, Southern Africa has its demographic transition sometimes, sometime in the late 1970s. But again, but again, that's aggregated data. So you're seeing switches in the fertility data depending on class, for instance, which I think you will need to pull out. But that was great. And I really look forward to seeing uh, more um, on the rest of this project. Thanks a lot. That was a long comment question. No, no, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. That's so useful, um, Natasha. I'm really grateful to you. Thank you very, very much, particularly for your comment about African societies, partly because it um, this is something that I've been thinking I must go and read about and uh, which I will be going to do now. Um, I, your points about um, birth rates and um, demographic transition are well taken um, and I need to go and read that and um, think more carefully about that. Your point about um, 19th century diagnoses of menopause by men, I, um, I, even though I am hesitant about making this a project about medicalization, I know that I'm going to be reading um, papers by medical professionals in the Cape at the same time. I haven't come across any of these in the archive as yet. Um, but I do want to use this as an opportunity to um, mention my favorite fact about 19th century menopause, which is that there was a scientist who believed that um, uh, menopause caused kleptomania in women, which um, I think is, is amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, really, truly, that, I think that's extraordinary. Um, but th this is something that I will investigate. Thank you very, very, very much. Julie. Thank you. I think this follows on very nicely. Uh, Sarah, you um, sent me back to the 19th century and I felt all invigorated again. Thank you. Um, I just want to know, are you focusing exclusively on the Cape or are you reaching beyond? Because um, if, you, if you're reaching beyond and you're looking for uh, accounts of cessation of childbirth and so on from, from colonial Natal, I can recommend the letters of Ellen McLeod. Uh, which were published as a book called Dear Louisa, and you and I can chat about that uh, an, another time. But I'm also I'm thinking about this diagnosis, this medicalization, and um, in the research that I did on the um, confinement uh, committal of women um, and men into um, a colonial asylum, um, I did manage to find, I checked on my stats this afternoon, that a small number of designate, women designated as European were uh, given a diagnosis of their illness, mental illness was caused by change of life. Um, but the, the stats are, are quite uh, low compared to other etiologies. And I was just thinking that if you uh, reaching in, into other archives than that of Falkenberg and the Grahamstown Asylums, um, which is quite well written up, um, could be interesting. And that could also maybe help you um, search for, for narratives about women who were also not mothers, um, who, who may have been um, committed um, to, to psychiatric hospitals. And um, just finally, um, I could mention the story of a woman that I've written about called Emma Lovett, who um, um, murdered her youngest child, um, ap apparently, in her own words, after going through the change of life. So um, thank you. And um, I hope you will find some of those suggestions, tips interesting. Oh, Julie, these are fantastic. Thank you so much. And I should say the joy is the only feeling that one should feel when going back to the 19th century, because it is the best century, I feel. Um, but I thank you so much. And I, my focus is not only on the Cape. I just really began on the Cape because that's what I know. I mean, really what I'd like this to do very, very ambitiously, I want this to include um, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, maybe India, parts of West Africa, East Africa as well, because I want to sort of cast my net as widely as possible. 
Thank you so much for these suggestions. And thank you so much, particularly for your point about the assignments. I just didn't think about that. That's such a brilliant idea. Thank you so much. So that last point about um, Beyond the Cape actually is a good segue into uh, a comment by one of our PhD students, Yi Young Li, who asked what other parts of empire you might be interested in. She's particularly interested in, in her question, at least in the, in the chat. I will send this to you, Sarah, at the end, um, in, in places such as Singapore, Hong Kong, um, where similar anxieties about the kind of reproductive role of, of women of European heritage um, in empire was important. Um, so uh, you, you're welcome, of course, to, to go to that. I also want to quickly draw attention to a question by uh, one of our other students, postgrad students, Amanda Mangana, who's an MA student, and she has asked me to, to I did check, uh, ask on her behalf, um, if you have more information about the experiences of older Black women who lived at the time that you're looking at. Um, and she also points out uh, what actually I was going to ask about, and um, I sort of insert myself here, which is the role of, of, of Black women in, as, as nurses, maids and in fact specifically wet nurses um, and there is one reference to this in your question and my sense actually Gerald Kronewald is a person who will know most about this um, and he might well want to pipe up but I, I my sense is, is from Robert Shell's work is that um, of course women in the category of kind of the social status and class you're looking at would probably and evidently did based on that one reference in your paper, uh, employ uh, black women as uh, wet nurses, and in the early Cape, they would have been slaves. So, um, and in fact, uh, Shell seems to date the sort of decline of wet nurses to around the period of, of, of the abolition of slavery in the Cape, um, when, of course, slaves are no longer uh, importable into the colony and um, when in fact they uh, become female slaves become mothers in their own right um, for reasons of the reproduction of the slave population. So I suppose if I could just tack on to Amanda's question, the question really about wet nurses, uh, which seems a, a, a potentially fruitful avenue. And then I see hands from Timbisa and Pamela, and of course we might have some more still. Thank you so much, Stephen, and, and thank you also, I didn't catch your names, thank you to the two students who spoke through Stephen too, all of you, I'm grateful. Um, your question, so first about the question about other parts of um, empire that, and it's just so interesting that you mentioned Hong Kong, um, I've actually just been reading about um, girlhood in Hong Kong and was thinking, in fact, that this is a, a case study I really must include, I hadn't thought about Singapore. Um, so yes, your question of wetness is so important. And um, I haven't included this in the paper just because it's so rich on its own and sort of felt like a slightly different story. Um, but these women's letters are replete with information about the, the families, um, the men and women who um, they employed as servants, who and who I suspect had probably had longer links with these families that began under enslavement and continued afterwards. Um, and the women um, who are nursemaids, nurses, maids, uh, nannies are of, of course called ayahs, um, and um, ayahs sort of speak through their um, employers in these letters, sending love and affection and what, and, and, and so there are certainly older black women who do appear in these letters. Um, it's difficult to gauge their ages, of course, um, and um, but it would that often um, these are, are women who might be the same age as the women who are, who are employing them. So it's quite possible that these are women who might be going through perimenopause themselves. And I want to see if I can find a way of reading for that. But uh, you know, just more specifically on your question of, of witnessing, I mean, these women are in this particular family that I'm writing about are interesting in that they do, these women do breastfeed themselves and, and less under very specific um, circumstances. Um, if they're ill, if they, have, um, if they have twins, they tend to breastfeed themselves. Um, and my, feel, my impression from, from what I've read from their letters is that the reason they do this is because it partly comes from their religion is that, that as mothers um, who are um, nurturing another sort of godly generation that they see breastfeeding as sort of part of this project. Um, so their abandonment of breastfeeding comes part, is partly a product of their um, Christianity. Um, I don't know if this answers your question, but it's, it's one way of, of, of beginning to broach it. 
uh, I mean, it's a nice it, wet nursing of does and slavery would be a very obviously obvious kind of beginning point, maybe not beginning point of of, of the project. Uh, Tembisa. Thanks. Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me? Thanks for this very lovely and stimulating paper. Um, and I guess this is more of a suggestion, but I'm thinking that the concept of imperial frontiers also in terms of markets and the circulations of commodities and particularly patent medicines, um, you know, which of course promise to meet every need of the self and the body, um, and which also seem to be linked into imperial networks of sales and advertising and all of that could be a, a really interesting source um, also about, you know, changes of, uh, I don't know, sexual identities and uh, experiences of sexuality as well as reproduction in these different stages of life. Um, I've also been through a little town like Willamore, <laughs> and I'm trying to imagine how menopause for women in small towns would be, would differ around the country and how, you know, traveling peddlers and salesmen could be a vector of, of information or thinking about these changes of life. So um, I guess I'm wondering, I, I'm, I know you've only done a couple of weeks research, but I guess I was just thinking that pharmaceutical tracts and adverts might speak to these changes of life, both indirectly and directly, and maybe prescriptions for certain behaviors um, or even proscriptions associated with not taking certain kinds of food or medicines at certain age. So yeah, that's just my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, that, that is so useful. And in fact, I had a question for you, if you don't mind, because these women who I, whose letters I've been reading make use of homeopathic remedies all the time. Um, have you encountered these? You know, I haven't done any real research on homeopathy at all, but I know that there, I have found different tracks and at this particular period there are, I don't know, there's, there's just a wealth of adverts and tracts coming from different parts of the world, including the USA and yeah. uh, England and uh, missionaries are of course, you know, really important in, in these kinds of things. But I, I also wonder if there's not, um, I can't remember if it's uh, electricity. I think it might be a little later period kind of comes into it as well. Um, I'll have a look and if I, I'll send you anything I can find specifically. Thank Thanks, you. I think that's, um, I'd be very grateful to you because, I mean, what you're saying sort of adds to um, what I know is that these women are reading um, all sorts of books and magazines that are being printed from all over the world. They're part of the sort of cosmopolitan, upper middle class, Dutch African elite who read everything. So it would make sense to me that as they would read a book about menopause, that and there was there was one bestseller in the late 19th century, which I'm sure these women must have read or at least have had the opportunity of reading. It makes sense to me that absolutely they would have encountered patent medicines. And they write in their letters about homeopathy that and they call it so-called homeopathy I was very excited when I came across this so um you're absolutely right also I just like your point about this that this is a kind of a spatial history of menopause that how does menopause feel like in a small town as opposed to a city I think that's a really really great question thank you Julie Powell pointed out that Ellen McLeod, who she mentioned, um, did not want to use a wet, a wet nurse or specifically did not want to use a, a black wet nurse. Um, and uh, she and her, her white neighbor alternated breastfeeding uh, their children. Um, so there's obviously lots to explore as it relates to your, your topic. Pamela? I'll come on. Uh, the benefit of going a little later is that now I'm just really in conversation with, <laughs> with, with everybody. So um, I'm not sure any of these points are really new, but um, so just on the, on, indeed on the last point, um, and this is so nice, Sarah, it's just fabulous. And I love Zoom. I love that I can be here. Um, is that, you know, it, to the extent that there might, of the, I would assume also that the interest in homeopathy doesn't just go from the written, I imagine, you know, there, there might be indigenous um, remedies and there's a whole 
conversation there, perhaps about motherhood and menopause that might be interesting to explore. Um, and then echoing Natasha's point, um, you know, the, the literature on gender and generation, uh, particularly in West African history, you know, is quite well explored. And I'm just wondering um, what it would what it would be like to put this conversation about menopause in, in conversation with that. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it, but it might it might both expand um, the conversation on West African uh, women's history, but also I think the point about, you know, at least what you were saying about age, the significance of age and the status that uh, other people were saying that comes with menop postmenopausal women. So I think, I just think there's a literature that would be interesting to be in conversation with. Um, and then I'm also thinking about, and again, I think this is echoing maybe something you said earlier, but um, how can we think about menopause divorced from actual reproduction. So, you know, what for the women who never have children? Or, or and I'm actually thinking of someone like uh, Olive Schreiner, you know, who did have connections to the Murray family, but she had a child who died. But what did it mean to go through menopause for women who never had children? Um, so just to, if, if we're trying to think about it beyond um, just medicalization, the conventional, I think that would be interesting because menopause is so often tied to actually having had children. So. And then um, I think finally, um, I really, I really liked your idea. Um, I think it answered one of the questions about the way, how can we think about motherhood itself expanding as a concept? Um, and I'm thinking particularly tied uh, to racial thinking in the colonies and the rise of, you know, institute, more, more institutionalized race, racism. Um, and so it immediately just, you know, the thing made me think about it was, um, a long time ago, I wrote something on this about how um, white feminists, many who would be sort of linked to these kind of British feminists who came out to South Africa in the early 19th century, um, sort of leveraged their notions of motherhood and maternity to justify the expansion of the vote to white women, um, saying that they would be good, quote unquote, mothers to the black population, who, of course, were then, they were then represented as children. So I just think, I think there's something really significant going on in that idea about how motherhood, maternity, and tying it to, to racial consciousness and racism in, that, in the changing 19th, early 20th century, and how, I have no idea, but how menopause relates to that, I think is, you know, it could well be that those women, now that I think of it, could have been older women claiming things. Um, and then finally, <laughs> I'll just say I'm really enthused because um, I'm starting a project actually on um, thinking about um, rape in wartime and the way that it has been um, uh, um, taken up as a, a justice issue in the 20th and the 21st centuries. And I'm working with Hattie Hill and Scanlon, we right at the beginning, but that there's something about the role of postmenopausal women who, who, you know, have had enough. They have just had enough. They're going to speak to truth to power. And I'm just wondering, you know, back to the gender and generation issue, whether there's something there that might be worth thinking about. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a, and, th and thank you very much for your link to that exhibition. I'll go and take a look and, and that your project sounds fantastic. Um, thank you so much. These are fantastic um, suggestions. And in fact, your article about um, women claiming motherhood um, to, uh, claim, to get the vote is, was what, what I was thinking about when I made that point. Um, so um, yes, so yeah, I agree with you completely. Thinking about that literature on gender and generation is absolutely crucial. And in fact, I have just been reading a lot of it and I was hoping that it, it might sort of come through in this paper because it, it exactly that you have that I was that as uh, to put it very simplistically that so often in the present menopause is framed as a, some kind of catastrophe that it's this terrible moment in women's lives which in cause occasions a crisis but we have plenty of examples from particularly pre-colonial African history that demonstrate it's a shift in a way of being in a society it's a moment of I mean to use the you know a, not a very useful and not precise word, but it's a moment of empowerment in particular ways. And I think that that literature exactly can inform this thinking because it's a different way of thinking about menopause um, and, and a way of thinking about menopause as being a socially constructed um, a, a category as well. Um, yes, and the, I agree. I have a line, in fact, in the paper about wanting to be attentive to the experiences of women who don't have children, um, because I, I find that this particularly interesting and so far the women who I've been able to come I've encountered other than Schreiner who is such an interesting figure are women who are teachers that you know the, the legions of women who enter teaching and who don't have children but who mother their 
who mother um, their pupils and think of themselves as mother, mothers in that way. Um, so does menopause mean the same for them because their mothering doesn't really change um, when they go through menopause as it does in fact for women who have had huge numbers of children, even though they still might be mothering children well into, small children well into their 50s. So yes, this is something to which I am very, very, I'm very interested in. So thank you. So we don't, I don't see any more hands unless somebody wants to raise one at the last minute. Um, I will send you the, the chat, Sarah, and I just wanted to thank you and everyone for this. I, I think it was the definition of what a seminar should be, which is a, a real conversation and back and forth and, and alive. So uh, thank you to you and thank you to everyone for joining us. And I see Megan is sending a comment about widowhood. Um, so there's, there's a lot yes. to talk about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very everyone. much, everyone. Your questions are amazing. I'm exhausted. I'm going to go lie down. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Take care and we'll Bye. see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.